I'll just let you into my life so you know my point of view on things. Um, yesterday I picked my nose and then I didn't want to wipe it on my couch. So I was too lazy to get up and get a Kleenex. So I put it back in my nose. <laughs> December I fell I, I fell real bad as I was, I was, uh, was at home I, was, I fell in the shower I was drunk I was drinking in the shower I drink in my shower I drink in my shower not like I need to drink so much that it carries over I wait for the shower I choose to drink in the shower because everybody deserves a spa day in this world and <laughs> I'm glad you agree with me. Why is, it, why is it perfectly acceptable? Oh, drive out somewhere and go to a spa, and if you lay down in their establishment with rose petals and champagne, that's fine. But I do it vertically in my own home with a six-pack on the back of the toilet for easy reach, and I'm some sort of scumbag all of a sudden? <laughs> It's the one room you can be alone and naked and have a cocktail in. Every other room in your house has a, you know, a drink appointed to it. What are, you, on, are you on the porch? Have a mint julep on the porch. There. Oh, what are, you, what are you, in your living room? Have a sophisticated scotch or a snifter of brandy. What are you, in the garage, tinkering around with your motors? I have a beer in the garage. But oh, I'm gonna have something in the bathroom. Like, you should probably go to meetings. No, man, I don't <laughs> agree to that. I set it up. I have an event for myself. I have the drinks on the back of the toilet. Don't bring them in there with you. You don't need them that close. I have a waterproof Bluetooth speaker for the shower shelf. I put the iPod on shuffle in the other room, and I let Steve Jobs DJ my mood from beyond the grave. And he gets it right. All right, DJ Steve, that's the 160 gig model, 35,000 songs. I got about a nine ex roommates' libraries on there. What can you do for me? Five Motorhead tunes and three Lionel Richie jams. Shit. <laughs> Get into it. Motorhead's playing. What do you do? You're guzzling the beers. You're living life. Flash dance your problems away. It should come as no surprise when I tell you that I belong to the Facebook fan page for Red Lobster Cheddar Bay Biscuits. <laughs> for obvious reasons, they're delicious, they're cheddary, they're a perfect prelude to your entree, whatever you might be having. Also, in my heart of hearts, I hope that somewhere in this world, there really is a geographic location known as Cheddar Bay. <laughs> somewhere maybe north of Nova Scotia where the sailors can guide their weary vessels into the cheesy waves. <laughs> and the salty fog will hit them, and they'll all be carrying treasures and necklaces for their port lovers by the name of Brandy. <laughs> that being said, I was privy to witness something by being a member of that fan page. For whatever reason, the day Michael Jackson died, the Cheddar Biscuit fan page became an unofficial forum for mourning the loss of a recording legend. I have no idea why, but that day, the Venn diagram of Cheddar Bay Biscuit fans and Michael Jackson fans eclipsed itself. They found each other. And I don't know, I don't know if that's a, a true mark that as a society we're gonna make it because that's technology and human compassion intertwining to support one another, or if that's a clear sign of end of times. I don't know. But all I know is you go on there the day Michael, and it is hundreds of comments of people just just eulogizing the death of the king of pop. Just, oh my God, Mike, oh my, RIP, Michael, we love you. Your music meant so much. Just, just does, it does. The thing is though, every 60 or 70 comments, somebody will log in and leave a comment that clearly had not heard the news yet. <laughs> so that's like, like comment 63 will be like, oh my God, Michael Jackson, you meant so much. RIP, rest in peace, uh, good luck in heaven, man. And then comment 64 will just be somebody going, man, Cheddar Bay Biscuits are the <laughs> am I right? <laughs> and the thing is, it, it would be so quickly policed by the Cheddar Biscuit community though, because you can see the time code by minute, and like a minute after, somebody would just be like, Cheddar Biscuits are the sh A minute later, somebody you could tell was just like, listen dude, today's not about Cheddar Biscuits, today's about MJ, okay? 
Like, they were angry, but they knew, okay, he doesn't know, he doesn't know. And you could feel the remorse emanate from your, you could just feel that guy like, I am so sorry. I just, I wake up, I stretch, and I log on to my Cheddar Biscuits fan page to see what my brothers and sisters are up to. I do not go to national news sites. I come here to express joy out of this appetizer. And I don't know if that's beautiful or terrifying, but it's something, man, I don't know. I went down to London, and uh, I went on the Jack the Ripper tour in London, because that's what I do still. Like, I should grow up, but that's the stuff I'm into. And it's a big deal there, like, there's still big advertisements, like, you gotta go on this Jack the Ripper tour. And it's from the 1800s, but that's still their big uh, tour thing. Go on the Jack the Ripper tour, and you sign up for a tour, and there's so many tours, there's like competing tours, and they're cutting each other off in the street. There's so, it's so popular. And you sign up, and you get assigned a tour guide who's just a decrepit little English man. And, you know, he's got like, and he's dressed in the period, he's got a top hat and a cloak, and he's using the scariest British voice, or maybe just his British voice, because it's hard to tell. <laughs> With the old ones. The old ones always sound like they're just dooming you no matter what, you know? What time is it? Uh, 7.30. <laughs> right. he's, he's leading us around the city on this tour, and the tour is interesting, but it's hard to focus on because you're still in a modern city, so he's trying to put you in the time period that this all happened, and he'll stop you on some part of the street where he's like, and here, one of the victims was found dissected with medical precision, but you're still in front of a KFC. It's kind of like, man. <laughs> it's hard to focus. I'm like, not dissect a family bucket with medical precision. Man. <laughs> this tour is boring as shit. But then we get to the end of it. We get to the big finale, and he's got everybody gathered around, and this is this big climax moment of the tour, and he's got everybody there, and this is where he just sends it home. And he's got everybody goes, he's, and it's believed that in total, Jack the Ripper may have killed up to five victims. <laughs> Now, I know that this is a weird time to get welled up with national pride. <laughs> but I had to turn to my friend. I was like, did he say five? <laughs> We've been rolling our ankles on cobblestone for three hours? For five? We paid 60 pounds. I don't even know how much that is in real money. <laughs> For fucking five? And I got real USA. I was like, I'm from America, baby. We got somebody killing five people right now. <laughs> and we don't give them walking tours, neither. You have a walking tour for everybody that killed five people in this country. The whole 48 lower states would just look like half price tickets at Disneyland. That's what it just looked like. <laughs> Wisconsin alone would have so many people and they'd be tipping off into the lake. <laughs> you kill five people, you could defend yourself in court after killing five people <laughs> and get off with like just like a warning. That's where we're at. You can be like, all right, yeah, I know what happened, Your Honor, but listen, you know how they say McDonald's has breakfast all day? Yeah, and then you get your hopes up, but then they can still run out of that shit, and that's what they don't tell you when you're trying to have an Egg McMuffin for dinner and like, we're out of Canadian bacon. Sure, I got a little out of hand. I got a little, I got a little out of hand. The judge is like, rough weekend, I understand. We all have it, we all have it, we all have it. It's a rough weekend. You kill one person on an accident in America, you don't even get arrested anymore. They make you a cop. That's what happens. <laughs> I don't want to be a police officer. It doesn't matter. You pass the test. You're qualified. Welcome to the force. Loneliness is a subjective term. You know, it's, it's different for everybody. I mean, you're cast away on an island. There's nobody around. That's lonely. You know, but it could also mean you lack the simple courage to be able to say hello to somebody sitting next to you on a bus. That's lonely too, you know? For me, I can define loneliness 
I can just hone it in as the very moment that I realized that I had forgotten I was masturbating <laughs> at a motel in Green Bay, Wisconsin. <laughs> That's it. That's the point. That's what I remember. Just, it's not even sexual anymore. It's just like an aggressive shooing away of a nuisance at this point. So like, come on, get out of here. <laughs> it's like I'm taking a broom to get raccoons off the porch. Like, come on, come on, just, yeah, come on, yeah. I understand now why a dog can hump something but still look right at you. <laughs> like, I understand that when you see a dog, it's like, what, this feels good and you're my buddy. What's why? <laughs> you're the one making it weird. What? Why? <laughs> it was. I was just, like, in the shower and there was a dead-eyed staring at a wall. And I realized that uh, on the shelf there, I bought the little size of uh, uh, shampoos. I bought dandruff shampoo on accident. And I saw that... And I was like, I don't have dandruff. And I remember that's like the old head and shoulders jingle. Because I was like, I don't have dandruff. And then out loud, I just went, exactly. And I got, <laughs> I had a little chuckle. I had a little chuckle to myself. I was like, that's fine. If you're, if you're making jokes like this and you're in a shower, you're right to go out there and pursue your dreams, Kyle. You're on the right path. You're doing this stuff in the shower. You're cutting yourself up. You're doing the right thing with your life. Anyway, what else? What were we doing? Oh, yeah, well. <laughs> I found the key to happiness, I think is what it is. You just gotta loosen up your definition of what a miracle can be. <laughs> That's all it is. Everybody's like, what's a miracle? Like, I oh, don't like probably like a statue that cries. Like, Stop it, turn that way down. <laughs> Stop going top shelf with your miracles. Start going well with those miracles. Stop look. All a miracle is is the world letting you know it can still surprise you. I experienced a miracle uh, recently. I burnt my laundry. <laughs> and that should have been something that would have pissed me off, but I didn't even know that you could do that. <laughs> I just sat at the laundromat with a meteorite of my favorite T-shirts. <laughs> And instead of being frustrated, I chose to have a sense of wonderment about it. Instead of being angry, I was just looking at everybody else holding this meteor like, did you know this could even happen? I used the same quarters in the same machine as everybody else. You all got fresh smelling laundry. I created a new element for the universe. And that was followed by a half hour of me just holding up going, I am the alchemist, which that put everybody off a little bit. But that's all you need to be happy. Thank you very much. Cheers to the meltdown.